What is up, guys? It is the one, the only Fatal Indian here. How are you doing today? I hope you're all having a groovy good day because I know I am. You want to know why? We're talking about high school track and field in this video and how to photograph it. It's one of my favorite sports that I participated in when I was younger, and I'm very much excited to get back out there for my third season and photograph it. Of course, a lot of these tips can be incorporated into collegiate and professional levels, but I feel like you know what you're doing already if you're shooting at that level. But nonetheless, hopefully this video will be able to help you get some insight on how to photograph track. So without further ado, let's get into it. So the first thing you need to know about before you even show up is you're not going to be able to cover all the action. There is so much going on at a track and field meet. You got events over here, athletes over there, this going on over here. You're not going to be able to cover everyone. And Again, your surroundings are going to be crazy. You need to make sure you're paying attention of what is going on around you because there are people everywhere. So you don't want to be in the way of any athletes warming up or actually participating in their event because that'd be the worst if you were to get plowed over and ooh, there goes your camera for one. Two, your reputation is going to be ruined because you're interrupting the track meet. And three, you're going to get kicked out. So try not to interrupt the events and pay attention to your surroundings. And this is where the announcers are going to become your best friends. They're going to be doing roll calls, first call, second call, third call, throughout the course of every event for that matter. And you want to kind of get in position by second call. So first call is when the, the race is announced. Second call is when the athletes should be warmed up, ready to go. Third call is when the event is about to start. So once when third call comes around, you need to make sure you are in position of whatever event you're trying to capture so that way you don't miss the action. And again, this will help you, you know, be more aware to your surroundings. So that way you're not in the way of a certain event that is going on. And moving on into equipment, by all means, you don't need the top of the line high end camera. You don't need a 400 mil f 2.8 lens by any means. If you're able to afford one, so be it. Hopefully I can get one soon myself. But anyways, don't let the camera equipment hinder you. You don't need anything crazy expensive, none, none of that top of the line stuff. Of course, it's going to help a lot, but you don't need it, especially starting out. For me, I started out with a 70 to 180 Tamron f2.8 lens paired with a Sony a6400 crop sensor body. This total came out to about $2,000. So that might sound like a lot of money, but it's not nothing compared to a lens such as this, which is $3,000 just for the lens or my other camera body that I'm recording this video on. It's, they're, they're certainly more expensive, but starting out, you don't need anything super crazy. I would highly recommend if you are able to though, try to keep your f-stop as low as possible for your lenses. So if you can get a lens that has an f-stop of f2.8, you are in good business. That alone will already make your images look a lot better than what they would look like on a lens that is only capable of shooting at f5.6 or 6.3 those lenses are going to give your images just a stale look because everything is going to be in focus a lower f-stop will allow more bouquet to appear in your images and allow your subject to stand out much more and that is what you're going for with track and field photos especially if you're trying to single out a specific athlete it really gives them a pop and makes them look good and that's what you're going for and really that's all you need is just one single lens obviously if you have been in the business for a few years now and such Get some different lenses, add some more variety to your shots and such, get some different composites, all that stuff. For me, my second year, I actually got a 30 mil lens as well as a 24 to 70 mil lens. This allowed me to get a much more diverse action all around the board from up close shots of the athletes to great block start photos, all that stuff. But by all means, again, you do not need that just starting off. A telephoto lens will be your bread and butter for just about any sport, but especially track and field. And also make sure you got some extra batteries on hand as well as memory cards. You never know when you're going to need them and that'd be a terrible experience to have your batteries die on you and no way of charging them or anything like that. I actually almost had that happen to me where my batteries almost went dead at a track meet, but thankfully I gave some to the concession stand to charge and they were kind enough to do so. So that way I had enough battery life to get me through the meet. So again, make sure you have some extra cards and batteries on hand to help fuel you through the rest of the meet. Moving on to settings. Settings are going to be a wide array for just about any person I can imagine you'd ask. But for my staple, I like to keep my f-stop as low as possible. Once again, f2.8 if you get your lens is capable of. I like to keep my shutter speed at 1 1600th of a second as well. This allows for all the action to freeze and just get a lot of great pictures, especially if you're doing like a the this long jump the long jump when they hit the dirt and all the dirt explodes if you're able to freeze all that and get just 
the image looks beautiful. For ISO, I like to keep my ISO as low as possible just to reduce the grain of my images. However, this season might be a little different just because my camera body is more enhanced and capable of shooting at higher ISOs. But still, nonetheless, I like to keep my ISOs a little lower to avoid noise, but it may need to be adjusted during the day in going into the evening hours because again, lighting is gonna change. So you might need to bump up your ISO a little bit to make your images look a little bit more brighter. So if I do do that and I'm in that case scenario, I try to bump it up to no more than 800 ISO just because I don't wanna overdo it. I also like to shoot in burst mode with continuous focus. The reason why I like to do burst mode is because when you got an athlete coming out of the blocks, for example, it's gonna take multiple shots of that sequence. So that way you're not just getting like one photo of the kid doing this. No, instead you're getting the full sequence of them exploding out of the blocks. And the continuous focus, the reason why I use that is so that way the camera, once when I lock onto my subject, so once when I hold the shutter button down, the athlete is focused. And once when they do their sequence, it's just gonna keep taking a photo of that focused subject rather than if I use continuous shutter where I would have to refocus every single time a photo would take. That's gonna make you miss a lot of shots. So if you've got continuous focus, I highly recommend you use it. So moving on to actually photographing the field events and running events, I personally like to get as low as possible. So if you ever see me, which I doubt you have, but if you ever see me at a track meet, I'm more than likely sitting or laying on the ground so that way I can get the most composure of the image. And not only does getting low help make your athlete look more dominant, it also is a great way to get rid of a lot of the background noise that's going on, like spectators or whatever have you be. For example, the throwing events, there's a lot of people standing around waiting to, for their turn to throw. So if you're able to sit down and get more of a up angle at them, it kind of helps eliminate that background noise and makes the image look more flattering. And since we're on the topic of throwing events, I will say I'm not very much experienced with photographing the throwing events. These are the events I typically avoid, not because I don't want to do them, but just because a lot of other events are going on that I'm more interested in. And they, the throwing events are typically way out of the way of the actual running and other events that I'm focusing on. So it's hard to prioritize what events I wanna do. And a lot of the time the throwers kind of just get thrown under the bus and I tend to forget about them. But if I ever do photograph the throwers, I like to sit down, get a view of them when they're kind of in a stance, ready to throw their projectile. And as they go through the motion of them actually letting go of the projectile, that's another great photo is if you can get it leaving their hand. So this, again, this is why I shoot continuous burst mode. So that way you're getting multiple sequences of them doing their, their motion. And if you have a telephoto lens, especially a more beefier telephoto lens, you can always go down to the, the throwing range. If you're photographing discus, you might wanna be careful because uh, people can throw these things really far and that'd be a shame if you got hit with it. But if you're able to get a telephoto lens, this is a great opportunity to get far, farther back and zoom in on the athlete and get them doing their sequence and such. But again, back to what I mentioned earlier, there's gonna be a lot of background noise, there's gonna be a lot of other athletes and such in the image, so it might not look too flattering. Moving on to other field events, these are more fun for me. I, I really, again, like the, the long jump just for the sand pit explosion. So a lot of time I like to lay down literally right in front of the sand pit, well, maybe not necessarily right in front of the sand pit, just because some athletes are very powerful and they go far. So you wanna make sure that you, if you got a crazy athlete that can jump, that you're back up further so that way when they do hit the dirt, they don't trample over you because I've seen it and I've actually almost came in the line of fire of that. So be careful for that. But you can get a lot of great shots with the log jump. Again, when they hit the dirt, that's what you're looking for. When they hit the dirt and the dirt just explodes. Seriously, some great images and all the athletes love it. For high jump, it's gonna be a little different you wanna to try to position yourself at the bar level. So you might have to bend down a little bit and focus on the bar. And you also gotta pay attention for your athlete and how they jump. Some athletes jump different legs. So what I mean by that is when they're going over the bar, you might not be able to see their face. You're just gonna get the back of their head. So try to pay attention to your athletes. That way you can move around the mat a little bit and kind of just play with your, your stance, I guess you can say, wherever you're positioning yourself, and try to get the photo of them leaping over the bar with their face. Those photos are incredible as well. But again, 
play around with it and see what you like the most. Moving on to pole vault. Pole vault's another thing that I don't typically photograph just because the, the running events typically are going on at this time, but you can get a lot of great photos of this. So this will kind of relate back to the high jump where you want to try to pay attention to how your athlete is jumping. When they're pole vaulting over the bar, you want to try to make sure you're kind of positioning it where you can see their face. So you might need to move around the mat quite a few times. And what I'd like to do is get the shot of them, well, one, leaping over the bar, and two, if you can get it where once when they get over the bar, some of the other ath some athletes actually, when they get over the bar, they grab the pole on their way down. And it, it also looks very cool if you're able to capture a photo like that where they're falling down, holding onto the bar. Now moving on to the running events, these are going to be a wide array of different things. We're just going to start off right off the bat with relays. Relay exchange zones are great photo opportunities where the athletes are passing off the baton to the next runner incredible photos you just got to be cautious that you are not in the line of sight especially for some of the more longer distance relays because typically the exchange zones are all going to be in the the first lane of the track so if you are in the way of the exchange zone as they're coming through a lot of time once when the they the runner hands out the baton to the next runner they just dip they literally turn directly off the track and more often than not, you might get walked into. So try to be careful with that and position yourself accordingly per baton handoff exchange zone area. While we're talking about relays as well, other than the baton exchange zones, you can get some great shots at the starting lines, obviously, and the finish lines. This can go across the charts with any event. The finish line and the start line are always some great opportunities to get some great photos. The reason why I like the starting zones is because you can get some great photos of block runners and them exploding out of the blocks, especially with like the baton and such. It just looks very, very cool. And of course, the finish line shots, everybody knows all about them. You can get the runner going through, giving it their all, doing the heroic leap, passing the finish line. A lot of great opportunity there too. Another thing I'd like to mention is don't stop or put your camera down once when the race is complete because you do not know what is going to happen after. For example, say it's a sprint. As soon as the runner passes the finish line, don't put your camera down because you do not know what's going to happen. You get a lot of great shots of athletes, you know, patting each other on the back, handshaking, hugging, or even tumbling. I've seen it in many scenarios where an athlete's given it their all. And once they cross the finish line, sometimes I might put my camera down and then the athlete tumbles or something like that, adding for like a dramatic sequence. And if I was able to have my camera up and capture that, that would add some more memories and such for that athlete or the parents or whatever have you be. It may seem very disrespectful to do so, but trust me, a lot of the athletes do like those photos. And you can also use this for after a long distance run too. I know those runs are brutal from personal experience. And two, just watch those races. Some of those athletes are running so hard. And once when they pass the finish line, a lot of time they might just tumble on the ground and sit there and just try to get some airflow back in them and such. And you get a lot of dramatic shots from those races. I'm not sure if I mentioned this either, but for sprints, this literally relates to all sprints from the 100 meter dash, 200 meter dash, 400 meter dash, all the, the sprinting events, I either stay at the starting lines or the finish lines, just because that's where all the action once again is. And that's where you're going to get a lot of great shots. If you're, say you're at like the, the hundred meter mark of a, the 200 meter dash, you might not get too flattering photos. So that's why I like to position myself at the finish line for a lot of those events. Cause again, you're getting a lot of great shots of the athletes running through the finish line, giving it their all. Moving on into the hurdles, the hurdles, you can get a lot of great shots too, from just about anywhere. For me, for the 300 meter hurdles, I like to position myself in the, the 150 meter mark as the hurdlers are coming around the corner. You can get some great shots there. And actually, I got my favorite hurdle shot about uh, yeah, 200 meters in, I would say. Now, about, yeah, about 150 meters in, a hurdler jumped over, nobody was in sight, and the sun was beaming down on them, and it was just them in frame. And it, it just looks so cool. So hurdles, you can get a lot of great shots, again, just about anywhere. But try to get a shot of them going over the hurdle if possible. That's where you want to get the action. Moving on into the longer distance runs, such as the 800, the mile, and the two mile. This is going to be a very different race compared to the sprints because they're much more slower. You have a lot more opportunity to get a different range of shots. So for me, I like to kind of just move around all over the place throughout those events because you can get great photos from the starting line. You can move into the 100 meter zone, get some photos of the athletes running around the corner there. Uh, you can move over to the 300 meter mark of the track where athletes, for example, on the, the final lap of an event where they're coming around the corner and giving it their all, 
you can get some great shots there too of just the competitiveness, especially if there's two runners like side by side trying to just beat one another. It is incredible. Get a lot of good shots there too. And there you have it. That is how I have photographed track and field throughout the last couple of years. I hope it was informative. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to drop some comments down below and I'd be happy to get back to you. If you're looking for some more assistance on track and field as well, I'm gonna leave a link to a video down in the description below by a gentleman named Bill. His video was actually what kind of helped get me started photographing track and field when I started a couple years ago. So feel free to go check that video out as well and get some insight from that gentleman. But again, there you guys have it. I hope this video was beneficial to you. And I hope to see you in the next video or live stream that I do whenever that will be. But as always, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you for watching.